planting some potatoes planting some potatoes and, and some seeds uh, vegetables so we have a lot to do today okay it's rather windy yeah uh so i, I will not take part in the meeting uh okay, you can just listen you don't have to uh, but i would just talk. wanted to say hi oh, and uh, mm -mm. i'll keep you company so I, I, I i look i look at that recording yeah. later Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We are tomorrow. We we are doing a house cleaning at the body's place. We are preparing, and uh, as my friend Anders here is talking on the phone, is resting. Yeah. So we had a, 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 a little rest, and now we will work again. We did the dishes as well. Nice. We had some coffee and then a little lay down, just a little short rest. So, okay. yeah. so this is uh, on a farm outside Uppsala, Sweden. Look, look, how beautiful, oh, beautiful. clear day. Yeah, I take the other camera. Let's see. What kind of light mm -hmm. around you everywhere? It's great. Yeah, I think you see enough. And over there is a brewery, uh, brews excellent beer over there. Okay. Uh, 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 excellent beer, a lot of uh, spontaneous, spontaneous uh, fermentation and um, uh, 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 sour beer. Uh, and they do, and they do um, uh, soft drinks as well. Okay. They do their own mm -hmm. lemonade. They, they, like a banana cola, like a Coca Cola with banana flavor, yeah. and uh, all, all strange shit. And, okay. and have a excellent uh, artist doing the, all the labels, and they are doing really good. Uh, international, also outside Sweden in the U.S. They're exporting their beer, and um, and in, in Europe, so they they did a really good business, uh, and re they do a really good craft. As well, of course, but they're, they're business-wise pretty, pretty awesome as well. Okay. So I'm really glad for them. They are my friends. And uh, now, now we will soon start uh, putting some potatoes uh, in the earth. Yeah. Okay. Catch you later. Bye bye. Thanks, Al. Good to see you. Catch you on the recording. Never.
go after Homeland or it's practically federal policy. No one is going after anyone. Just a gentle reminder of who's in charge. I assume you saw him on camera call me this morning. He set the boundaries. And when that happens, you have to discipline that mic. Well, mic, a power group. Mic with Zoe. Zoe, don't rip my spine. That's not a one. He used foul language to have her dinner. So we make a public statement. A stern reprimand, some FCC fines, nothing serious, just a reminder that he can't get away with anything. He's got the power. He'll be perfect, they say. Zoe. Especially Zoe. Homelander might bark a little, but he won't bite. He's still afraid of me. I would never let anything happen to you or Zoe. Hey, Tony. See you trying to connect here. There he is. Hello, hey, Sam. Have you, I, I've done a bunch today already. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did the wall bunch. behind you. Oh, yeah. That's the spirit wall. Well, oh, is that what that walls. is? This is, this is the whole meditation temple. You know, I was building something like that before my fire. Well, I mean, Anywhere could be my meditation temple, but this is just the space that the yeah. kids are less likely to be to pull things down. <laughs> and uh, it's furthest from the bedroom. And so it's the place that I spend most time at night. Okay, things that help you focus, things that help your mind go where they need to. Yep. My, my version of that, I was printing out all of these colorful images that represented all of the different ways of thinking about things there were. So I had charts about numerology, astrology, chakras, uh, five element theory. Uh, and I would use that wall anytime I was trying to think about something new. So it became a list of things that I could check for metaphorical uh, cohesion. Like maybe something happens if I think about it using astrology that isn't useful, but it's there and might as well grab it while I'm thinking about it. And then, oh, numerology says this, something different, or chakra theory says this. But for whatever reason, when you do the five elements, whoa, there's something really pops out. And so that must be something behind that construction, which is driving this idea. And then those metaphors become more useful, uh, at least to try in terms of determining what to figure out first. That was what my meditation wall did, but it, it was all cardboard and paper. It was in the basement, so it got torched. I didn't even see it was anything left. It was just gone, turned to ash. All right, well, I am uh, starting now. I'm gonna put a little message in there, starting now. All right. So today's lecture um, is an impromptu addition to the syllabus. Uh, and that's because sometimes information reaches us in impromptu ways. And uh, I'm gonna start this lecture by referencing the chart behind me and making a prediction, uh, and a, predic a prediction that is more true uh, more likely to be true in direct proportion to how many of these lectures you've watched out of order. <laughs> so this is where everybody who's been vibing with me so far is most likely to betray me. This is where everybody who uh, seeks higher consciousness uh, and to elevate is most likely to betray me. And I'll explain why, because I am about to crit critique the source of your power. <laughs> and I'm not going to critique it in a way that says this power should be abandoned. Uh, it's quite the opposite, actually. I'm going to critique oh. it in the way that says you're only using half of it because you're scared of what it would mean to use the other. That's my prediction. I would definitely rewind that one minute for Patricia. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, because Patricia has watched more of these out of order than I, than, than, 
and stuff. Now she's been following along in the chat though, so she's she might be inoculated against this prediction a little bit. Uh, but uh, so I said, I made a prediction. The more of these episodes you have watched out of order, the more likely it is that a moment of betrayal is approaching. And that moment of betrayal against me is uh, going to be specifically around the emotion centered people, people who understand the world through vibes because they want to elevate frequency because they're ruled by frequency. Um, and an elevation of frequency grants perspective. And usually from an emotional sense, having a bigger perspective makes you feel better because it does. So that's the part of it that everybody agrees is good and is a source of power. But where people will betray me is when I point to a certain behavior of direction. Hey, how come you only go this way? How come you're always trying to get away from that other thing? How come that thing is always bad, which circles back to why that is greater uh, of a probability, the less of these lectures that you've watched in order, because most of these lectures spend a lot of time talking about the neutrality of potential. And so if something bad could happen, if you lack the competence to prevent that bad thing from happening, then avoidance is wise. If another person can manage to do it, it becomes a fear response if you tell them they shouldn't do it either. So that's the test. Can I do this or should anybody do this? If, if the answer is, could I do this? Well, then maybe you could learn how. If the response is, should anybody do this? I would worry about yourself before you worry about what everybody else should think. Because guess what? Thinking about that does jack shit because those people don't know you. You're keeping your mind busy so it doesn't think about the thing you could do. But that betrayal is only likely if, uh, if, if you watch so many of these uh, that you haven't been convinced that the opposite side uh, of, of a potential is just as neutral as the side that, that's being used or favored currently. And it is the choices of application that determine negative outcome, not the, not the object of potential that's being used. And you could say that for, for anything. And I'm going to throw out a hot button one because we've been seeing that right now. Uh, mass shootings are when somebody takes a gun and does what you shouldn't do with it. And 100% of mass shootings, uh, almost 100% of mass shootings end with somebody using a gun to stop the person from using it the way they shouldn't. Or that person uses that gun on themselves and the shooting stops. So grand opening, grand closing. Perfect example of what happens when. So it's a situational thing. We don't say that because this gun was used that the gun is evil, you have to put the context around it. And when you strip context, well, you strip perspective. Uh, and that is a bad use of the lower frequencies that are behind me, the anger, fear, grief, apathy. Any of those sound familiar with the gun debate? Maybe all of them? Look at what that does to the perspective. It narrows it. So. We can see there two examples of power being used, um, one to lose life and one to prevent further loss of life, which is, well, if something is in motion, you can't pretend that motion doesn't exist before you can have a situation to behave in that is acting like that doesn't exist, right? You can say what shouldn't be and what should be all that you want. But until you have a neutral playing field where you can put those things into action, you're going to be proven a liar because reality isn't cooperating with your words. And when the words go out of their way to change reality, well, that's a recipe for reality uh, to keep doing what it's going to do. And you're too busy talking about why it shouldn't be allowed uh, to even join the conversation where it's at now. You're behind. You're still trying to figure it out. You can't impact it at all because reality isn't even being acknowledged. You got to take the whole picture, which is the, the side of, of, that I like to do. Look at it from both sides. 
when does it make sense? When does it not make sense? When is this power tyrannical? When is this power something that protects against tyranny? Well, that's what we're gonna we're gonna talk about today a little bit. Um, but this the, the the title of this uh, lecture is a little bit impromptu, so I, I don't have a, a set title uh, like I usually do. Um, but I, I have a I have a topic and, and I have it organized, which is good enough for now. It'll just be a maybe a less wordy title as possible in the future, but this one will cover all the bases. So today's lecture is anxiety. And the mathematics of frequency direction change. So, yeah, whoa, that's, uh, come on, man. That's, what are you talking about? Are you a space cadet or something? Okay, so it's assumed that if you're listening to these lectures that you are able to grab words that represent things from other belief systems and apply those metaphors. So... If those metaphors leave a bad taste in your mouth, then go back to the shadows on uh, the shadows. Go back to the shadows, which is what I meant to say. Go back to the lectures on shadow boxing and figure out why those words bother you so much that you won't hear them. Because I don't let anybody judge my words until I know they've been heard. And if somebody wants to defend their right to not understand me, that's fine. But I will defend my right to make sure it is painfully obvious that they don't understand me and that I'm defending their right to be stupid. And I say stupid because they've chosen not to understand. You're ignorant when you don't understand, but you want to. So I, I just, all I do is notice the transition from ignorant to stupid. Why? Because I know what that transition looks like. I'm ignorant sometimes, and I know what it looks like to go from ignorant to smart. So I can tell if I'm standing still and someone's moving away from me, <laughs> which you can do mathematically if you watch these other lectures. You just point towards or away. What, what, are, what are things are being talked about? What things are being avoided? Uh, what's behind it all? Is it a reaction? Is it a logic train? Or is it a reaction to a reaction? Is it running from a different feeling and putting a bunch of feelings on top of that to make it stronger? Tony needs to be stronger. He's struggling with that jar right now. Ah, he did it. Good job, brother. All right. So I talk about frequency. So I'm going to, that's the first thing I'm going to define. So frequency is, uh, there's a couple of angles that this topic has been approached for in the past. And I'm going to start with the scientific one, the medical frequency. Um, your organs make vibration. They have a, there's a thing where if they measure it, this vibration comes out. So that's, that's, a, that's a set of things that we were able to measure with a frequency measuring machine and we wrote down the numbers. So then we're like, okay, so these numbers are obviously coming from here. And then there's a whole medical thing behind that. So I'm not gonna bother with that because that's a whole lecture on itself. Uh, and it's a pretty good one too. Uh, more or less, um, and this, uh, I guess I'll point out why it's useful is if you're already too sick, sorry, you missed the boat. The frequency alteration of the body doesn't reverse time. It doesn't undo causality. It doesn't save you from the consequences of your bad actions or your missing actions. So that's number one. This is not a cure for cancer. This is not a cure for your broken thing in the same way that going to the gym is not a cure for cancer and going to the gym is not a cure for your broken thing, especially if you're trying to exercise the thing that's broken. So if you are living in that part of the world for you, temporarily speaking, the right answer was to do the right thing 20 years ago, which could have avoided this, which we can say about any bad decision anyone's ever made. So that's the distinction I wanna make here. Frequencies are preventative. They're strengthening. That's the science of it. What it means is that your body has a frequency that it operates at peak efficiency at, and that frequency is different for different parts. So if, for whatever reason, your body is not doing the best it can do, maybe you've got a problem or you've got a problem that is emotionally scrambling the messages that you send to yourself, you're living in anxiety, you're living in fear, you're living in anger, you're living in stress, you are producing a stimuli 
that affects the frequencies of your entire body. And we covered that extensively in the lecture about quantum wave addition and how it ties to the emotional spectrum. So if you want the proof behind that, that's the lecture to grab it. So that is what I speak of is if you are currently living in a state where you do not have total harmony with your body, but nothing is actually, and I'm using the quotes wrong because you're all slowly aging. <laughs> Everybody's got that one. So the only thing that's wrong with everybody at the same time is we're all getting older. Uh, there's a trade, but your body uh, is not going to win that trade eventually. You're going to trade out. So this is another one of those things where you could lump it into a healthy diet, exercise, proper attitudes about stress and anger. All of the things that mean a responsible person should do them when they don't think they need to because it's not going to stop what's wrong with them right now. It is the, it is the uh, at its core, it's really the, the dismissal of responsibility. A discussed response to being the one to take as much time to clean up a mess as it took to make it. I don't want to go to the gym because I'm 400 pounds and it would take me 10 years to lose all that weight. Well, it probably would. You haven't said anything that's false. You don't want to go to the gym. You're 400 pounds. It'll take you 10 years to lose the weight. So what? You're listing things that are true. Keep going. So I'm going to be 400 pounds. My knees are going to turn to jello when I'm 55. I'm going to need a CPAP machine uh, in my 30s. I'm going to slowly suffocate and suffer from respiratory problems as my heart is encased in a layer of fat and my liver slowly turns the same as well. All of those things are true. And if you're happy, fine. Don't ask for us a round of applause on your way out because other people might want to do something different. And if you're suffering from a lack of whatever, well, the right answer was to go 10 years into the past. Uh, and not do that. The best answer you have now is to look at the 10 years you might have left. So that's kind of where this falls. This is a preventative. So if you say, oh, that's not going to do anything. Yeah, neither are you. Good job. Way to, way to, way to not break that cycle. Go fuck yourself and die. <laughs> because if you have that attitude about things like this when it comes to learning, you fuck yourself until you die. I don't cause it. Just pointing at it. If it's not happening, I'm not talking about you. So if you think you're fucking yourself and die, get mad at me for saying it. If I'm not talking about you, then, then we're fine. So why go through all of that large preamble, right? Like that's what well, I'll tell you. If you followed along in this class, I'm setting you up for something. <laughs> I am creating an emotional state that will be receptive to what I'm about to say. I'm poking your emotions to make sure that they're not incompatible with the message. And if they're not, you're still listening. Good job. If they are, shadow boxing. It works. So why do I predict uh, betrayal when I talk about these things? Well, because we've covered a lot of fear in this, in this thing. And this is the chapter on anxiety. Um, specifically, this is how to control anxiety. This is the anatomy of anxiety. This is where it gets its power. So when I talk about power, I still use the neutral form. Um, anxiety is useful. It's a nice place to visit when something you need is there. It's not a place to live. And it's not a place you want to visit unless you plan to go. Um, and actually, I'm going to take a quick two minute break to use the restroom because uh, I don't want to be distracted while I'm while I'm talking about this. Yes, I'm doing good. I'm trying. I just made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and I'm putting away groceries because um, my daughter wants to make something healthy for breakfast, so she's probably going to do that. Oh, she wants strawberries that I'm going to let her get once the counter's clear, and then I've got dishes to do, and the day will begin. Wow. Well, how about you? 
basically the same. <laughs> I have to cook plain Saturday things. I got uh, some carrots and some onions and I've got pepper and I think I'm going to cook it with rice. I'm going to, I'm going to do so I'm going to, I know I want carrots and rice. The question is what else am I going to put with it? <laughs> you can keep playing that stage if you want to. All right, back in the saddle again here. All right, so uh, kind of pick off, pick up where I was left off. Uh, I got a picture behind me. All right, so this here, it uh, it, it kind of lays out the frequency of emotions, and the numbers next to those frequencies don't matter for the purposes of this conversation. Um, there's a whole field behind them and different people believe different things about them. The only thing that I need to understand and anyone needs to understand for this is the direction of that spectrum and what happens when you're on it. And all of it ties to perspective. So that's the, that's the correlation here. When you are happy, you notice more things. When you're angry, you notice less things. When you're ashamed, you can't even remember anything. Try to forget. Try to forget on purpose. So we're talking about an expansion of consciousness. So why do I predict that the emotional people will betray me for this lecture? The logically aligned people will, this one will go down easier for them. There's advantages to logic. If there wasn't bad advantages to logic, then you wouldn't have a problem being called illogical. So that's the test there. If being called illogical is a badge of honor, then you can also say that that logic isn't better at some things than emotions are. So when I speak about it that way, the emotionally inclined person has a strong connection to their senses and their reactions to situations. They understand the world by how it feels. And you can feel when things are right and you can feel when things are wrong. That's great. That's potential. A lot of potential there. That thing felt bad, therefore it must be bad. And everything that makes me feel that way is also bad. No. <laughs> well, let, let's say that, that, that you're the one person in the world who hasn't fallen into that trap. Good for you. Everybody else, that's what we're stuck with at some level until we figure out the tricks you know, to get out of it. But let's talk about what happens when you keep going in one direction. Fear doesn't care where you go so long as it is away. So sometimes you can pick something to run from, and every time you get farther away from it, it feels better. So let's talk about that. Apathy, shame, grief, and fear. That'll make you want to kill yourself if you live there. So say somebody recognizes that. It's a threat to their survival. It is. Somebody recognizes this is no way to live. It isn't. Uh, somebody says there's something wrong with me and I need to change. There is. You do. Good job. Like that's the right answer. If your goal is to not have those be the only options you have for dealing with the world. So let's focus on the people who actually do that, that job. I don't care about the groups of people who say you can't change it. Uh, I'm going to be here till I die. Fair enough. I'm not going to stop you. It's your life's goal. You defend it every chance you get. Who am I to say you're wrong? Live there. Don't get any on me. Don't leave a mess. Get your shit together, at least as far as it impacts other people. And you're doing the bare minimum a human should do 
to get to be responsible for their choices. If you're asking someone else and they agree, that's fine too. If your fear means someone else is in charge of your mess, no, you're wrong. Get over yourself and grow up or be a child forever and be miserable. The rest of us are the ones I'm talking about. So all of those people, anybody who was mad by that, I'm, my conversation to you ends here. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. None of these words beyond here are for you. If you take them, now do what you would do with any other stolen thing. Twist it, pervert it, sell it, break it. It's not yours. You won't care about it. Fine. I need your blessing. I'm done with you. This is for the people who want to change. This is for the people who want to see that there's more. So anybody who betrays me for my message here, goodbye. Everyone else, why do I talk about the direction? Um, all of these other lectures have been focused on direction because direction is how you navigate. Direction is how you triangulate. Direction is how you figure out where you're coming from and where you're headed. So to know where you're coming from and where you're headed, you can't make a point because a point is a fixed position. Everything heads towards that. A point is what you measure from. Does everything I say move towards that point? Does everything I say move away from it? Why is that point the one that doesn't make sense? Why is that point the one that's rejected? I'm gonna kick you. Tony, I'm gonna make it so I can't see your cam. I just moved you off screen. I get distracted too easy. Um, so I can't see you, Tony, but I can still hear you. Um, so we got, uh, so, so why? why? Why would I spend all that time focusing on that? Well, if you look at that scale, it seems like each one of the choices above the one below it looks a little bit nicer. Would I rather have anger or pride? Oh, maybe neither one of those are great options, but at least pride isn't miserable. Okay, would I rather have courage or pride? Well, I'd love to be courageous. Uh, neutrality or courage? Would I love to be objective? Hell yeah. Would I like to be willing more than I would like to be angry? Would I love to love more than I would like to accept? What would make me feel better? Accepting is just being okay that it exists, but not necessarily doing much more than that. Love, no, that's a part of the process uh, to, to, to make that something into more than it is. What about peace? Would I rather have peace or anger? Would I rather have peace or neutrality? Well, neutrality is fine so long as nobody breaks the truce. Peace is good because you promise to work together to keep the, keep the truce alive. Enlightenment, whoa, well, there you go. Who wouldn't want enlightenment? Everything fits there. If I'm enlightened, I don't need anything else. That's the lie. You're not enlightened if you think you don't need anything else besides enlightenment. You're scared. You might be enlightened and scared. You might be enlightened about everything that doesn't have to do with uh, what you're running from. This is why the people who, who generate uh, and identify with the emotions are most likely to betray me at this point. Because I'm going to tell you that half of your power, uh, half of your potential exists in being able to raise a lower frequency to a higher one. Why? because none of the things on that list are the right answer for every action that is happening in the world. Enlightenment is to see what's going to happen well enough to try to build something worthwhile. Shame is for when it's currently fucked up and somebody needs to take responsibility and action that shouldn't need to be taken because it should have been prevented. So to only go up is to live in the world that should be because you can see how it could be better. 
And if all of those perspectives are designed to make it so you can see a world that exists without fear and grief and apathy and shame, well, that's not a bad thing. Because who wouldn't want to create a world where those things weren't part of the normal human everyday experience? But there's a responsibility that goes along with that power. There's a responsibility that goes along with that potential. There's a set of actions that need to be taken causally so that dream manifests into reality. It doesn't matter how beautiful your idea is if you never make it real. It's a good dream. Um, I'm sure there are outliers to everything. Can you also give an extreme example of that? Like you, Which can, one? you know, you know our dance already. Um, the last thing you said, you said, uh, "No good dream just remains an idea." Or the the what I what I heard from it, my internal you know thing was uh, I had the same process as better safe than sorry, mm -hmm. and what I heard you say was that you see no benefit to just having an idea that never goes anywhere or something. No, I, I heard no, that's not. So see, what I heard well, when you said that was you you don't see a benefit from saying that but we need to rewind the tape though. your dreams won't make them happen. All I'm but saying we is need if to rewind the tape, it doesn't get built, it doesn't get built. Okay, what was that, that part? If a thing exists in your brain and it doesn't get built, then it only exists in your brain. That's the only thing I say. Whether that's good or bad is up to the. There we go. You could build a. That that seemed you could more build a money. Shooting in your head, and never carry it out. That's a good dream that never gets fulfilled. It's a fucked up dream from everyone else's perspective, but the person who created it, it could be rich, full, cover many details. It would know exactly what world would be perfect for them to live in. But if they never do a thing to make it real, then it doesn't become real. That's, that's the thing. So that could also be said, this world that I want to live in where everybody loves each other and nobody goes out of their way to be intolerant and everybody does these things and nobody needs any guns. Okay, that's the dream. Well, why isn't the world like that right now? Because you share that dream with other people. I want this to happen. Hey, I want it to happen too. And then they say, oh, it's because of this. This needs to change. Well, that's a fundamental core part of humanity. You're starting the game too late. If humanity needs to change, your dream is unrealistic. Your dream needs to be big enough so that it can include humans as they are and work, which is where the other half of your potential lives. So who makes the biggest splash in these things? Um, and it's sad that it's true. The person who takes the gun and tries to bring their dream to life. They are physically, and, I, and I, I'm using the word effective neutrally because it's not a blessing, obviously. They are physically more effective at manifesting what was in their head than someone who doesn't do anything. And if the people who have the dreams about what it needs to take to make a better world are the ones who don't take action and the ones who have a reality of how to build part of their dream and know that it will recreate if they do certain things, they have more of building things than you do but they live in the negative end of the spectrum. They don't visit it. They're ruled by it, which is why knowing how to escape that perspective is wise. If you only escape that perspective, so you never, ever, ever have to go back, you will never be able to go back for the people who are still there. Because you refuse to go. And I've heard of many, many different explanations for this. Oh, that's inviting a demon into your soul. 
that's uh, lowering your frequency is negative for your health. Doing all of these things will hurt your psychology. It will, it will make you less of a person. It, this, you should just free yourself from these things forever. Go fuck yourself because fear is not optional. Free yourself from it ever. You're so afraid of being afraid that you don't recognize the irony. Stop it. You're too enlightened for that shit. Nobody's too enlightened for irony to work on them. So learn to see it. Nietzsche, great example. He'll teach you, teach you about irony and how every idea bites itself in the ass if you chase it long enough. So you have to know where the idea needs to begin and end. If you start the idea in the middle, it will bite itself in the ass before it does what it's trying to do. So what do you do? Do you say the idea is bad forever? No, make it bigger. Yes, and. Use enlightenment. That's perspective. Use enlightenment to make shit happen. You need to understand everything that's preventing it from happening. All that stuff at the bottom. Anger, desire, fear, grief, apathy, shame. Why? Because the people who are in that, look at the perspective cone. It's narrow. The language is narrow. The ideas are narrow. And I say narrow specifically because it means they're very focused. Lasers are very focused. You can use lasers to, to cure cancer. If it's small enough, they zap it out. You can use lasers to blow a hole in someone's head. Everything in between. So it's not the focus. That's the problem. It's what the focus is focused on. Don't blame the potential. The potential is focus. Everything else is after the fact. Why shame? Is it good shame or not? Is it shame at something that is shameful? Like trying to make other people feel ashamed so they'll listen to you. That's shameful. Shame on you. Not shame on everyone who didn't do anything because they don't agree with you. That's one example. Grief. When should we be sad? We covered that in the last one. Fear. When should we be afraid? So you see why this lead, leads up to this. This idea doesn't work if these states of mind have morality attached to them. So the first thing to remove before this tool will work is the fear of creativity. The fear of enhanced perspective. Well, what does enhanced perspective do? Well, it makes you see more. So if you're afraid of something and you think it's good to be afraid of that thing, you're going to respond negatively to everything that tries to expand your perspective on that fear. Because no, that fear is, whoa, no, I, I already know that it's right and wrong. But what about this? Whoa, you're just trying to make me doubt myself. You're already doubting yourself. You wouldn't say that if you weren't doubting yourself. You're telling yourself that you're wrong to doubt yourself and you're blaming me. I don't even know you. I'm just reflecting words that you understand however you're going to understand them. Everybody's going to hear this lecture differently because we covered bad biases and fallacies for, for fallacies and biases for 12 hours. That's how your brain works. It's why you need languages of thought to communicate effectively with other people. That's everybody. Uh, unless you hit the lottery, I guess, and everyone loves you and you feel great every day for no reason. Chances are, if you're that person, you're not here. <laughs> so I can take a safe bet that I'm not talking to that one guy who's got it all going on so far. So if any of these things hit a nerve and your goal is to spread misery, you're spreading misery. Everything else that happens is also true. So now for the moment of betrayal. I'm going to talk about anxiety, and I'm going to talk about moving up and down this scale. And I'm going to tell you what powers it. And, uh, well, 
It's the same thing that powers everything else that moves. Fear and love. Now, are those the only ways to power a thing? No. But if I power this thing that way, I only need to worry about one thing that is going in one of either direction, which means I only need to know, do I need to think bigger or think smaller? So this is knowing how to test which range of perspective is the most competent perspective for your current situation. Somebody has a gun pointed at me. How much enlightenment do I need to stop them from pulling the trigger? There might be an amount that exists. How much breaking their face do I need to get them to stop pulling the trigger? Well, I only need to do that once. So sometimes efficiency matters. There's more than one way to skin a cat. You can emulate the usefulness of certain emotions without experiencing them. But you will not emulate the potential of knowing how that emotion can help you. Because there are certain times where the right answer is the only right answer. And everything else leads back to the same problem. So we're limited by what we won't. We're limited by what we know. We're limited by what we don't know, but we are by far the most limited by what we won't try. Because that's shit you know that you haven't tried. All the stuff you tried already hasn't worked. What are you going to do? Try stuff you don't know? Why do you have things left that you haven't tried if things are not perfect? What are you going to do? You're not going to make it worse. You're already miserable. Oh, no. <laughs> what am I going to do? Become less, uh, uh, less optimistic and more disillusioned with the world when I already think it's hopeless and that nothing I do matters except those 10 things I'll never try? Maybe you're right. I don't know. I keep trying them and I keep finding answers. But maybe I'm special. Maybe I've got the only brain in the world that works when you use it that way. I could accept that if everyone agrees with me. Put me in charge. Don't do that. I'd be miserable. <laughs> but that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the train of thought. That's where it goes. I want to be in charge, but here's a list of things I'll never do. A list of things I'll never think about. A list of ideas I'll never hear the other side of. Why are you telling me all the things you won't do before you'll tell me what you will do? I'd rather know what you're going to do. You can make any list look good if you just put things that aren't going to happen on it. I'm never going to kill a baby. I'm never going to rob a liquor store. I'm never going to choke out Tony for no reason and leave him naked on the side of the road with a broomstick uh, pointed up, waving a Confederate flag. Never, never in my life. Give me a medal. <laughs> because I can list the number of things I won't do to other people. Silly, right? It should be. It should be silly. But now strip the joke away. Here's how angry I'm allowed to get because people called me the wrong three letters. Here's the stuff I'm allowed to set on fire because someone hurt my feelings. Here's the thing I'm allowed to do to another person's life because they vote the wrong way. Oh, by the way, I'm not my opponent. Elect me. Give me a medal. Hey, look at this thing I put on my Facebook. This is what I believe. It, I believe I should never do this. Great. Give yourself a medal. And everyone who agrees with you. You know who wins? Trophy shops. That's it. That's it. You don't win. People win by what they're willing to do. If you define yourself by what you won't do, you'll make yourself smaller until you're nothing. And anything that challenges what little you have left will make you feel threatened. And to do anything to keep it, which is why fear is such an effective messenger. 
I know what to be afraid of. Those guys. Don't you tell me I should learn how to love them. Uh -uh. No, that cut me off at the balls. Yeah. If, if you don't have a broader perspective to see how loving them could get you to stop the whole cycle if you did it smart enough. And don't wait until they have a gun in your face because you've called them stupid things for the last 20 years. If somebody does violence because a lifetime of violence has been committed against them, they're still violent. That can't be ignored. They need to be put down the minute their dream becomes reality because their dream is in their head. It's not the lives of the people who are around them. And if a consequence of that comes knocking at your door and you're nonviolent because that's the way the world should be, <laughs> well, be nonviolent. You won't have to worry about it for very much longer. Chances are you'll recognize the danger, try to run, or if you don't have a choice, try to fight. Or maybe you will freeze and get shot. That's a common reaction too. So that's the preamble. So how does all this tie to anxiety? Well, anxiety is, is a very specific kind of anticipation, which is the, the first word of this lecture. Anxiety is the first word, uh, is, is, a, is a flavor of anticipation. Anxiety is anticipating something you don't want to happen. Excitement is a positive anticipation of something you want to happen next. Both of those are focusing agents. Because look where they are, desire. Desire is at 125. That's below anger, fear, grief, etc. It's not a mistake that desire is in between anger and fear, fight and flight. People are afraid or angry for wanting things. Notice that. So if you have anxiety or if you have aggression, you don't understand why you want things and you're running from that stimuli. And what did Buddha say? <laughs> that fucking coward, but only for desire. He was a brave man to do the things he did, but he got it wrong for desire. He put desire in a box and said, it's bad. And he got enlightenment. But if you go down that story long enough, he comes back down from the mountain. Nobody likes to talk about that story. He talks about how to go up the mountain, and that is, you must understand your desires. You must understand your fear. You must be able to put them down. Those are true things, because a thing that you can't put down is, is part of you. And if you are fear, if you are grief, if you are shame, if you are anger, you don't have a choice. You're slave to them. So Buddha talks about how to get rid of that. He doesn't say nearly as much about what it means to pick them back up again, but he does come down from the mountain. Why? Desire. He wants to help people. So he takes love and uses it to, to, to justify desire. But every one of these emotional reactions justifies desire. Every one of these emotional actions up and down that scale makes it okay that you're not responsible for the decision you have about wanting a thing. I'm angry. Why are you angry? Oh, I'm just angry. Okay, well, these people did that thing. Well, why does that make you angry? Oh, well, you get down to it deep enough. People shouldn't act that way. That's a desire. That's a declaration. Why do you hide that? Because there's ownership. All of these other things you can blame on someone else. 
Desire is the only thing on that list that you can't blame on another person. And that's why it's the most covered up. So that's what I talk about when I say, curse your inevitable betrayal of me. Because I'm going to say that being able to put a thing down forever is not the same thing as being able to pick it up when you should. So how does it work? I, I made a big promise uh, to the chat group before this lecture. And I said, this is the way to end slavery to fear permanently. But it might be scary to try. Well, that's because you haven't ended the slavery to fear yet. If you're scared to try it, I'm right. Because once you hear it, it becomes a list of things you know that you won't try. Which I covered earlier in this lecture. So if you wish to remain blissfully ignorant, if you wish to have an excuse, turn off the lecture now and go away. Because once you hear these words, you are responsible for knowing them. And you are responsible for what you will and will not do with them. And if it is a mental exercise, I suggest, then I'm not going to listen very hard to people who are trying to defend being unwilling to use part of their brain. Because we have different words that we also use for people who actively don't use parts of their brain. None of them are flattering. The most forgiving one of those is trauma victim. And I don't mean emotional trauma. I mean physical trauma victim. They can't use that part of their brain because it's got a railroad spike through it. They don't have it anymore. They can't. All the rest of you. <laughs> so Steve Martin gets a pass. As long as he's got that hat on where it looks like the arrow that's shooting through his head. He got stuck halfway. He gets a pass on this one. Uh, if you've had one of your hemispheres of your brain removed because it was going to kill you if you kept it, you get a pass. If you have a bullet hole that went through your brain and fucked up one of your emotional centers and you just don't have access to that process anymore, you get a pass. All the rest of you who are stuck with depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, ADHD, you don't get a pass because you still have choices that you can make. So here's the choice, here's the trick, here's the secret to moving frequency up or down. You need to love anticipation. And I'm gonna talk about what it means to love a thing because love is one of those higher frequency things. People can do more than one thing with their emotions. You can be happy and sad at the same time. People can do that. If you ever cried and laughed at the same time, you understand what I'm talking about. If you've ever had a conflicting emotions, you know what I'm talking about. So unless your emotions are perfectly in one line all the time, you are a percentage of emotions and the top emotion wins. And the other emotions take the back seat and they, they can be ranked. So when I talk about love and anticipation, what you're doing is you no longer love what you're going to do. You no longer love yourself. That's the trick, right? Because things can stop that. Things can interrupt that. So why do I say specifically anticipation of what's going to happen next? It's not because you don't have some trick with love or some this or that. No, I'm telling you, this is how the machine works. The machine works because if you try to use it any other way, it fucks it up. It turns it about, it makes it about you. And if it's about you, you're going to get it wrong. If you are the goal, you're going to get it wrong. If you're the first goal anyways. Here's how you get around that problem is what I'm saying. You need to build a system 
that takes you out of it. And if you build that system and you engage with it by choice, guess what? You are giving yourself more perspective. You're giving yourself more control. You are not taking away tools, you're expanding them, which is exactly why people will resist that process. Why? Because it requires desire. And desire requires responsibility to manifest. So that's why this will feel like a bad idea. So you learn how to make it work for you. I want to love the next moment of my life. So I will anticipate loving the next moment of my life. Here's why that helps. We notice things we love more than we notice things we despise. Why? Because as you go up in frequency, perspective expands. So if you love what's about to happen next, as a rule, no conditions. I'll only be happy if I know this is going to happen next. That's fear. I'll only be happy if I can trust this. That's also fear. I'll be happy once this stops. That's anger. I'll only be happy if I get to do it my way. That's pride. But if you just say, as a rule, I'm deciding to love what's about to happen. What you're doing is looking at a world that is very close, it's very close to you in time, and it's going to happen. So two things happen. Number one, you start to notice how many perfect moments there are in your life. What about right now? I am sitting in a chair in an air conditioned home. I'm well fed. I have no threats to my future that are as far as I am in control. I'm doing what I like. This moment, the good moment, it's a small moment, but it's mine. I have ownership of it. Everything I've done before created this moment. And I can stay here as long as I want until something removes me from it or until I decide I want a different moment. This is everything I've ever made up to this point. And if I love myself, I should love the consequences of my own actions. But you can only do that if you can love wanting a thing for yourself. Because you decided it was right. Because guess what? Your actions produce your life. And your inaction produces the influences that impact your life. The choices you won't make, that you know about, influence the direction of your life. Anger, fear, grief, shame, pride, all of those things produce a fight or flight response. Do you want to fight the future? Do you want to fight in a single moment the entire weight of your entire life, which has led you to where you are right now? That's like fighting 10 million versions of yourself all at once. You're going to get creamed. Caring hard enough won't keep you alive when your choices have led you somewhere that is very far from where you want to go. You will have to go very far first to get back. Then you can go where you want, but you have to recognize where you are before you can leave. Unless the only thing you're trying to do is away. Doesn't matter where I go, so long as it's not there. That's fear. So what those types of responses do and look, it explains perfectly why. 
if your all of those things change focus, change the point of focus specifically, if you are using those emotions down at the bottom to calibrate the world, you better know exactly where to look if you don't have a bigger perspective. Because your choice will get pushed out of your perspective unless it's already something you agree with, if those are your navigation points. If that makes me feel bad or makes me angry, I don't want anything to do with it. Well, what about this thing? No. Well, they couldn't even see that thing. Why? Because anger makes your focus small. I should know. I had the smallest focus in the world because all I was taught from a very young age was how to be angry at things hard enough to get what you want. And that included everything, every weaponization of every emotion on this list. How to take those things and twist them down to a single point by making other people feel that same way until they could see what you did. Anger, desire, fear, apathy, shame. That is the cutting of perspective, which is the cutting off of love in some ways. So the only time I recommend using these things is when you love things that are hurting you. When you love to have the right to do a thing that makes you miserable. And I don't mean you have the right and somebody's going to take it away from you because no, you can have that right. So thank you for proving my point by having that reaction to that reaction. I'm talking about you, your decision inside to hang on to those things. So, so that, that was just a protection against glamorizing that into some sort of us versus them uh, narrative where all of a sudden you're given permission to defend these things because someone's trying to trick your jobs and trying to make me do what they want. No, you're the person making you do what you won't, won't do. And you're the person making you do what you will do. Everyone else just tries to enforce it. So... Learning to love the next moment of your life. That is a very broad perspective. Which means, as long as you're there, you're going to see very much. When you love a thing, you notice when it changes, even if it's small. Why? Because we're scared that it changed and we can't love it anymore. That's why. We're trying to make sure it's still okay to love the thing. I loved it then, but now it's slightly different. I better make sure it's still okay. All right, yeah, I can still love you, but you're on thin ice, Mr. and Mrs. <laughs> I think I covered everybody who wants to do what they want. Uh, which means that you'll start to notice how the little things in life move. Because you'll love your moment and you'll notice how they change. Now you will have an appropriate perspective on small causality. You'll notice what does what and how a very tiny thing can ripple into the future. Different for everybody, right? Uh, when I say that, it might be noticing that every time you react out of anger to somebody reacting at you in anger, you notice it makes your life worse. And you wouldn't do that if you loved what was about to happen in your life because you would notice that your response in that situation makes your life worse every time, whether you have the right to make your life worse or not. I'll never take away somebody's right to make their life worse. Just don't make mine worse as a result because you need to get bailed out. I don't have any love anymore because I live in this world of fear. And I don't like it that people don't like what I want. They reject me. Too bad. You've rejected yourself too, and you're trying to get someone to fill the gap for you. The evidence is if you don't care. I want to live in a world where you tell me what I want to hear. What are you going to do to make that happen? Well, I'm going to shame everybody who shames me. <laughs> okay. See where that gets you in 50 years. I'll give you a hint. Well, how what's happening right now looks the same as it did 50 years ago. What we're doing right now looks the same as it did 50 years ago, as far as information goes, as far as strategies about changing hearts and minds go. 
recognize the pattern you're in. How do you do that? You love the next moment you're about to create. You don't love the world that you want to exist. You love the world you have, love the world you've made because then you have ownership of it. Then you'll notice when it changes, you'll care that it changes in very small ways that you can see are small, but are further away from what you want to create as your next moment. The moment you have the most control over at all times is the moment right in front of you. That is not the past. That is not the future. That is not what everyone else does. You have a God complex on some level. If you think that your reach is that far, that it can change history or alter the course of future humanity by changing the core nature of humanity. That's an ego trip right there. And it's because you're being tripped by your ego. And your ego is telling you that I don't have ownership of my next moment because it shouldn't be my problem because this is how the world should be. So I'm going to be angry and surround my next moments with anger and see what that does to make the world a better place. And I'm going to shame these people who don't use the words I want. And I'm going to go out of my way to destroy lives. And that's what I'm going to spend all of my next moments on. And I'm going to go say a thing on Facebook because somebody else offended me with their words and they're clearly wrong. And so I'm going to fill my next moments with calling a person names and telling them who they are before I listen to have them tell me who they are. I'm going to tell them who they are. That's my next moment. Why? If you can't tell yourself why you're doing that, telling someone else who they are is what you wish you could do for yourself because you're running from every desire and layering a different emotion on it. Why? So that's the why. If you love your next moment and you take ownership of it, you eliminate all those other problems I just talked about. And that's good on its own because now what happens is so that's the positive side. That's where people, by the way, who find higher frequencies on their own try to live. So this is as high as you can go with that philosophy. All right. So I'm not saying it's a useless philosophy because if you currently live in grief, apathy, fear, desire, pride, etc., and you don't know how to get out, practicing how to love is a good first step because that will give you perspective you didn't have before. The perspective you shouldn't keep with you is that because those things hurt you in the past, that they will always hurt you every time in the future, and they have no utility ever. We covered that in a different lecture, why that's a stupid way to think, because some solutions that are happening right now don't care about what the world should be, and the right answer is one of those things. Most of the time, uh, let's talk about, um, here's a good metaphor, the game of war. I'm talking about the card game. Uh, you take a deck of cards and you, you, you deal them out and both people flip a card at the same time and whoever has the higher card wins. So that's, um, that's to say that uh, it's like a version of paper, rock, scissors. All right. So a situation exists and we're going to make a metaphor that's like the game of war because there's cards and matches and stuff. A situation exists and you have two emotions in the room. The number on the card is which one of those emotions has more ego behind it. It's the power behind that card. So the cards are different things. You got your fear, desire, grief, apathy, willingness, acceptance, reason, love, joy, peace, enlightenment. Those are the cards. The numbers on those cards is how strong that feeling is right now. So say you're in a situation where it's not violent. There's time to avoid consequence. Maybe love is the answer to anger. I've seen it work. I've seen it work more than anger. But that's misleading and that's a half truth. 
because this is why I use the game of war. Let's talk about what happens when people play the same card. What happens? You have a war. You flip other cards. Whoever has the higher card wins. Okay. There's some truth to that. Say that you are in a situation where anger is currently causing a problem and you need it to end right now. If you have better anger than that person, you can put a stop to that shit right away. And when I say better anger, I mean better integration of your anger into your system. If you've seen somebody who's angry because they're scared or somebody who's ashamed and they're angry, or somebody who is in grief and they're angry. I dare that person to say they can challenge someone who is angry and they love something. I fucking dare that person to say that my love for a thing and having that thing being threatened because you have ownership of things you love. That's my wife. That's my girlfriend. That's my boyfriend. That's my husband. Those are my kids. This is my car. That is my house. Those are the things we take ownership of or the things we love. So when I talk about lowering frequency, uh, there's a thing that happens in sound theory. So there's, there's, I watched a video on this recently and the visual kind of stuck with me. They take a flat medium like sand or something similar that can hold its shape uh, when it, it can move around and make shapes when you vibrate it. And they would put frequencies underneath them and they would make different shapes based on the frequencies. And that was all very good. Um, when they got to five frequencies, they could combine these things in such a way that it would make like uh, a shape, a 3D image. And it would have this little orbit. It would look very much like a planet rotating or something, or some other system. So it's just frequencies making a current and the sand is showing what's happening with the frequencies. So the frequencies are doing this thing invisibly already. Quantum wave addition. They come, they merge, they make this shape, they pass through, and then they go on their merry way. That's how wave addition works. Well, these systems have borders, boundaries, stable edges. They have a chaos inside that repeats very much like all information. So if you go back to the chapter on uh, the self-defeating nature of axioms, that's a visual representation of what I'm talking about. So the strongest thing makes the border. So if anger is being used to hold a thing, then anger is the border. So why do I talk about those frequencies coming together? Well, something very interesting happens when you raise the frequency or when you raise the amplitude, I'm sorry, when you raise the power behind the frequency, something interesting happens. The system speeds up. But if the system gets too much, the whole thing explodes like a supernova or these dust things that they do when they raise the amplitude too high. Poof. So sometimes the right answer to an emotion is such a concentrated form of that emotion that the person using it has no choice but to accept. They have just experienced that they do not know how to do this emotion right because that's what they're paying attention to. You can't use a thing and ignore it makes it vulnerable. So if somebody's angry and you show them what it really means to be angry, you strip away their anger and reveal the fear underneath it. And when someone's afraid, then they can make a choice. If you're a bad person, you'll make them afraid and you'll tell them choices that help you and not them. You'll put things in the media that say, buy this thing, do this thing, vote for that thing, because it'll make your fear go away. And anything that attacks that, what do they do? They put more fear on it till it destroys itself. If you're a good person and you strip away somebody's anger like that, and there is only fear left, 
the proper thing to do is to make them afraid of doing that again because it hurts them. So I'm gonna wrap this up now. Um, that's the potential, that's the why. Um, the theory behind that is to every situation that is potentially going to hurt a thing you love, which if you're doing this the way I've suggested is the next moment in your life, you cannot wait for the next moment of your life to happen because you are actively choosing to love what happens next to you. That's the choice. That's the free will. That's the part you can control. Uh, unless you can't control yourself, which an emotional person will have a very hard time admitting to. So unless you can't control yourself, you can choose to love the next moment of your life. Which means you can recognize when anger, when desire, when fear, when grief, when apathy, when shame are inserting themselves into your life and making it worse moment by moment. And then you can be angry about that. You can be afraid that your next moment will be tainted if I don't use this very small moment and counter it with a very small moment of my own, which I will know how to identify because I love the next moment and I'm very much in tune with things that would change it. So I'm going to bring this all full circle and say that to raise your frequency, you need to love the next moment of your life. To protect the next moment of your life, you must use your expanded vision to isolate, dissect, and break down and judge, which all require ownership of choice and emotion. So you don't get to have desire point you in a direction anymore. You pick the direction because you can see them all. And you can only see them all because you're choosing to love your next moment. And your brain does that on its own. Your brain makes it important. Your brain makes it noticeable. Your field of vision increases. Your speed of thought speeds up because you're not running from a reaction anymore. So to know how to love, expand your perspective. To know how to protect what you love so that your expanded perspective only exists in your mind. You need to learn how to lower your frequency enough to live there until you decide it's time to go. Because if you have ownership of those concepts, if you've truly beaten them, you already know how to leave. If you have left a place and you can't go back, that's not because you've left. You were kicked out and you're not welcome there anymore. There's no heroics in that. There is no personal edification there other than whatever belongs to someone who has escaped from prison has. If you put yourself in that prison, you've got nobody to cry to for letting yourself, you don't get a medal for letting yourself out. Look at all these ways I've stopped hurting myself. Look at all these ways I don't beat my children. Look at all these ways I don't commit violence in the streets. Why don't you break your other arm patting yourself on the back while you're at it? <laughs> then you might have something to complain about that I could agree with. Yeah, it sucks to have two broken arms. You still did it yourself, but at the very least. Um, so that's kind of the whole the whole kit and caboodle right there. And I'll get to you, Patricia, because I'm, I'm really like the very final home stretch. If you, wanna, if you wanna fix your focus, if you wanna be able to pay attention, all of that is tied to having no anxiety. Anxiety is incompatible with the love of the future. I'll say that again. Anxiety is incompatible with the love of the future. And that love gets stronger the closer that future is to becoming your present moment. So the closer you can get your love to the moment that is about to happen next, the more you insulate yourself against anxiety and fear. Which means if you have trouble focusing, that will fix that shit right up. That's all I got. That's the, the power of 
going up and down in frequency on the uh, emotional spectrum and why you don't leave anything behind because it's in you. If you leave it behind and you go somewhere else, it'll follow you. But you never really left it behind. You just don't talk about it. Like the uncle that, that touches people inappropriately. Uh, Patricia, you had a thing. Yeah, so is this right? You said love anticipation, right? That's the trick, yes. Anticipate in your next moment, right? Yep. Okay. So you kind of like, would that require you to have a, like a blueprint of what you want that moment to be? Yep. That's already, isn't that contracting the moment mm -hmm. itself? I mean, building up for anticipation in a um, anxiety in another way because not everyone is going to get what they set out to do. They right. they do. And if they're not prepared to understand that, automatically they go into that hypersensitive moment there. Absolutely. So if somebody is practicing that, like for example, and they don't quite get it right, here's how to know where it failed. Uh, and I'll tell you what it takes to get out of it too, because it's a very small thing. Um, people get trapped in these very big ideas um, of, of what it means to be able to be happy. So the first thing is to recognize that happiness uh, and control over the world can exist on a very, very small scale. So when I don't really have anything big to focus on, what I practice is to be in love with taking my next step. I don't have to think about left foot, right foot. You know, my body knows that well enough that it can do that without me directing traffic. So I can pay attention while that's going on. So I focus on this next step that I'm going to take is, is a good step. I feel like I'm moving towards a thing I want. My body is doing its thing. And then maybe there's 10 moments in the future where a thing's going to happen. Those moments aren't here yet. So basically, you're loving yourself in the moment, right? Because it's yourself that going into every right. second inch. And you can feel it. You know, you just know if something right or wrong because you love yourself. Right. That so that is how to that is how the double check. That is why it's close to the future. Is you will be able to feel when it's working and when you stop. Which, if you love the next moment you live, you'll also want to love the moments where you're loving yourself better. So that becomes the self generating mechanism to drive it forward. Because you have to recognize there is always a self generating driving mechanism that drives us. Most of the people are powered by anxiety. Anxiety that feeds on itself because it doesn't understand the future. So it tries to understand. It tries to understand. It tries. I got to know. It's got to know. Got to understand. I got to do this. Got to do this. And you run yourself ragged. Well, you can have that same locomotion of driving into the future, which is I love what's going to happen next. I love what's going to happen next. The only difference is one of those people looks like this. And the other person looks like this. And guess what? When you're angry, your eyes do this. They get smaller. You look like Gilbert Godfrey been squirting lemon juice in his eyes. Uh, he's dead now, I guess that. Well, he would have appreciated that joke. Uh, <laughs> what is going to happen next? Because I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm part Make of Make it small. It could be happiness. My next experience could be something from happiness, sadness, grief. Anything could just pelt out into my way, you know? Love the sun that is shining on you right now. Love me. So I shine out on everything. There you go. That's the, that's, yeah, exactly. And if you love yourself enough, you'll be able to love the parts of you that are ugly when you use them to break a cycle of ugliness that has entered your world. That's the only use for those things, in my opinion. But to say that they're never needed is running from reality. And that is the trap that people who chase only frequency in one direction fall into. I should not have to. You already know that you should at that point. I don't think it, it's possible to love yourself if you cannot see the bad, the ugly, and everything in you, like me. Like, I, I can't do it. I don't know, probably other people yeah. can do it, but I can't do it because this is a part of me that could come out at any point in time. If I am unaware of my actions and I need to recognize it as fast as I can, to bring it back. If you don't understand something that you love, you try. 
if you don't understand something that you hate, you try to get away. You try to destroy. Love tries to understand. So if you want your future to be compatible with understanding your life, you need to love the next moment because that's your best chance of understanding it. And when you understand something, you can use it better than you could before. So this isn't a guarantee uh, of good and bad. Why? Because needing a guarantee is a fucking desire that you're trying to layer over. Stop it. This is no guarantee. This is ownership. This is responsibility. This is free will. This is accepting the buck stops with you. This is what Buddha meant when he talked about freeing yourself from desire. He didn't mean that desire was bad. He meant that everything desire convinces us to do, traps us. And the secret to get out is to love yourself. That was Buddha's thing. So in this case, when you come full circle, if you are a Buddhist and you want and by the way, you shouldn't care about this. If you're a good Buddhist, you won't care about this. So if you're a Buddhist who cares about this, you're not doing it right. If you're a Buddhist who won't come down from the mountain, you're a coward. You got there and left everyone else behind. Good for you. I might ask you how you saved yourself. I won't believe you when you tell me what's good for everyone else because you decided leaving them behind was the best choice. Um, that's pretty much all I have on this. Uh, I'll close by saying if you have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder like I do, if you have problems with anxiety like I do, you can become the person that I can say I am right now and say, I don't have ADHD when I focus on loving the moment that's about to happen next. I don't have anxiety for as long as I'm focused on loving the next moment. And if you go back to the, the lecture on memory, where we talked about procedural memory, being able to reprogram implicit memory, because implicit memory is where your biases live, you can implant an intentional bias to bias yourself to always love the moment that's going to happen. All it takes is practice. So any questions? This was a, the big one here. This is the, the death of anxiety. All you have to do is get over yourself. <laughs> all you have to do is say that you want it if you take ownership of it uh, that's that's my lecture what do you what do you guys think anything tony patricia no <laughs> questions or anything it all makes sense as usual things are things are coming together better than usual so i mean I don't, I, you can't really go up from uh, the way things make sense, which is kind of like the star of approval. It's it's kind of binary. I think you get it though. We vibe. I think we vibe a little better every day. That's because yeah, I, that's what people I, write to vibe. I I practice how, Tony. And you practice vibing in your own way with everyone else in a similar way. You got it. Diversity is the key, which means. You're more diverse if you can learn to love people you hate. Because then if you can learn to love people you hate and you hate part of yourself, well, you already had some practice learning to love things you hate. Maybe you fuck it up a few of times trying to love someone else you hate. If you can crack that nut, you'll love yourself too. Thanks for watching. There's uh, three lectures left. There was three lectures left the last time I said that, but this time I mean it. What are you here? And I'll see you guys Tuesday. I'm thinking Monday night, nine o'clock. Okay. Um, love and hate. Excuse me, a reminder. Um, sometime I'll make the, day. the event. Yeah, I'll make the event and I'll also send out the link Monday. And I do very good with reminders. All right. Cool. I do too. Thanks, guys. I right, see you. Thank you, Tom. We love, I love you. Love you guys.